Generally speaking, the history of Western democracy is relatively short. After the Cold War ended, some celebrated triumphantly the so-called end of history. This week's guest warns of the rise of illiberal forces that threaten the democratic order we built after World War II. He's Edward Luce, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selva Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, filmmakers, authors, journalists, and more, to make sense of the big stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Edward Luce, the Washington columnist and commentator for the Financial Times, as well as the author of an important recent book, The Retreat of Western Liberalism. Ed, thank you for being here. It's great to be here, Jim. Thank so you. You, I, I've mentioned this to you. I read your book uh, while I was on vacation in February, uh, and uh, I'm not trying to flatter you, but I really think this is one of the most important books that I've read anyways in the last 15 years. Uh, it is a, a tremendous look, I think, at some big issues that I think quite often we ignore. Uh, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, tell us, though, let, let, let's start actually with just some real basic things so that the audience that might not re fully understand, so do they know where we're coming from. When we talk about Western liberalism or liberal democracy, we're not talking about political Democrats, Republicans, conservative, and liberal. We're talking about classic definition of liberalism. What are we, Absolutely. What are we talking about here? By liberalism, I don't mean Berkeley campus right. um, yeah, or you know, Portland. I mean the classical tradition of, um, that really was exemplified by the founding fathers here in America of having independent institutions, of having um, a, a strong um, accountability and rule of law built into the system, which generally in history precedes democracy, the full franchise where everybody could vote, including in America. Mm -hmm. The founding fathers did not give everybody the vote by any means. Um, and so when we talk about liberal democracy, we, they, they married in history in, in the last hundred years or so, but one came before the other. The liberal institutions came first. And it's the retreat of um, Western liberalism that, that I think is most alarming about the political trends we see across the Western world today, not just in America, but across the Atlantic, in my own country of birth, Britain, and in the former you know, countries of the Soviet Union, which were the most delighted to embrace the Western system of government when, when the Iron Curtain fell. Um, in the late 80s. And so why are the, why is Western liberalism in retreat now? Well, you know, this is a little bit like the sort of murder on the Orient Express. There are a lot of fingerprints on the dagger and some people emphasize the retreat of the middle class. And I think that is a very central part of this, that, you know, the fact that um, people are earning in real terms less today or the same today as they were at the beginning of the century in America in Britain um, and across most of the Western world. Uh, the fact that your chances of getting ahead, of realizing the American dream, of jumping from one income bracket to a much higher one are far lower than they've been really since before the Second World War and lower in America than across most of the Western world. These, these things are very important. The economic, the stagnation of the middle is very important. But there is also, you know, on the right, a reaction against rapid social change mm -hmm. and immigration. And I think the two are sort of, there's a chemical reaction between economic stagnation um, and reaction against social change that has produced this populist brew that we see in very, di very many different forms. Trump is clearly the, the example here, but we see it on the left too. My own country, Britain, as the Labour Party's been captured by a pretty hard left sort of Marxist era leader. Germany for the first time since the Second World War 
we see the, the rise of a neo-Nazi party. It's now got, got representation. Um, Austria, Italy, the, uh, has more than half of the electorate voted for uh, extreme populist parties, and they are now in a weird coalition government in Italy that is a sort of dagger pointed at the European project. There's mm -hmm. different manifestations of this populism in in every Western, almost every Western democracy. Um, but uh, the causes, I think, are fairly similar across the board. You mentioned the same trends are at work in other parts of the world, other parts of Europe, and you mentioned Russia. What, what is going on in Russia that, that relates to your book? Well, it's, it's interesting. At the beginning of this century, just 18 years ago, hmm. um, there were 25 more democracies in the world than there, than there are today. Um, Francis Fukuyama, the, the political scientist who called the end of history when the Soviet Union collapsed, calls this the democratic recession. Uh, one of those democracies, imperfect though it was, was Yeltsin's Russia. Right. Um, uh, and we saw it on the sort of arc of history that Obama and others so eloquently describe as moving towards uh, a less imperfect form of democracy over time. And of course, it's gone in the other direction under Putin. Um, it's become a more and more authoritarian state. It's tried to roll back. Uh, Putin himself describes what happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union as the, the biggest geopolitical tragedy um, of the 20th century. Um, and so what we've seen in Russia is what we've seen elsewhere. China is a far less free country today than it was in 2000. Again, we were expecting it to be on that escalator towards where we were. Sure, after Tiananmen Square and, and other developments, of course. After yeah. Tiananmen Square. Um, but its integration with the global economy, we took uh, as meaning it would have to gradually loosen its political control. It would have to become more free because you can't get rich unless you have thriving creative industries. And you can't have thriving creative industries if you have censorship and repression and no political parties. That's turning out not to be true, which is a, it poses a deep conundrum to the philosophy that we all have deeply bred in, in inside mm. us, that our system is, as Fukuyama said, the end point of history. Is as ideal as you're going to get, given human behavior. Yes, it's still, in my view, the least imperfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the worst system apart from all the others. <laughs> um, do, do you? Um, so I want to come back to the idea, though, the sort of the, the, the flatlining of incomes in the middle class. What accounts for that? Is that globalization? Are there other forces at play? Why are, why are middle class incomes stagnating? Uh, so I think globalization is unfairly blamed for most of it. It certainly plays a big role. But I think more important is automation, is the impact of technology. Um, on middle-skilled, middle-income jobs, the kind of jobs that were created by what, one of the best pieces of legislation ever, the GI Bill, mm -hmm. that put blue-collar people and their kids into university after the Second World War. The kinds of jobs that they got in the 50s and 60s, which could see them realistically tripling their income over their lifetime and seeing their children way better off than they are, are simply not economic. Um, given the kinds of technology and labor safe saving, labor substitution, um, automation that, that's become available. And I think globalization is not possible without technology. You know, if you think of the sort of, forget the internet, just think of the, the, the evolution of the super tanker and the size of ports. And this is a technological change mm -hmm. that then makes globalization possible. Politics, of course, finds it easier to blame China than to blame robots. But in China, we're seeing a shrinkage of manufacturing jobs, too. They're also automating. They're also investing in robots. Um, so what we have is not really a manufacturing crisis. It's a manufacturing jobs crisis. We are producing more than we ever produced, right. as is China. But we're just producing it with fewer and fewer people. And the gains from the production go to a, a thinner and thinner group of owners. So there is an inequality problem there. And there's a there's a, an earnings um, problem there with the middle class that's does, deeply technological. Does this, does this fundamentally change the social compact? I think it does. I think it does. I think the, the, the ultimate sort of secular religion of our societies that America expresses best is meritocracy, mm -hmm. is the idea that through your own labor and merit, your talents, 
um, that you can get ahead. It's the American dream. It is the American dream. Um, and it's the foundational creed, I think, of other Western democracies, too. We've taken that from you. Um, and that, that God, in the eyes of many people, not unfairly, not unjustly, has died mm. or is dying um, or isn't a God. Um, because, you know, you look, just to take any example of the cost of higher education, the price of admission into, you know, one of the, one of the top universities or even, you know, a middle-ranking university, how much harder it, it is for people who aren't legacy students, whose parents didn't go there, or, or who can't check one of the diversity boxes. The, the ground for meritocratic admissions of those who aren't poor enough to um, merit financial aid, um, but who don't check one of the boxes and don't have a parent who went to one of those universities, that keeps shrinking. And uh, the cost for those who do get through keeps rising very, very sharply. This is basically the sort of toll booth for a meritocratic labor market. It is getting squeezed and it is getting pricier. So I think when people hear meritocracy now um, and hear equality of opportunity, they often hear what they think are empty hypocritical slogans and they're with some reason. So one of the big questions obviously is these people who are being squeezed out in different ways that you have just described in terms of education or access to quality education in terms of jobs via automation and robotics, what do they do? Uh, well I guess they hope for a politics that serves them better than the one that does now and I think you know, it, this is one of the problems. The remedies are actually not that hard to think of. It's not that we lack ideas. You know, a, a Marshall Plan for the middle classes, um, you know, and a huge investment in skills from early learning through lifetime on the job training that involves the private sector as well as public um, partnership is something I think most economists, you know, whether they're conservative or liberal, would agree on in theory. Um, uh, uh, updating the New Deal for the gig economy to make them portable, portable, these benefits, health and retirement, so that they account for the fact that a lot of people do multiple part-time jobs or are job hopping, and so they can bring these benefits, have some security. These kinds of things are not lacking. What's lacking is a politics that is anywhere near to implementing these kinds of remedies, let alone even debating them. Um, and I think that's the problem. Politics needs a middle ground. It needs a strong middle ground. And if that's missing in the economy, if the economy is being hollowed out, some going down, some going up, but the middle, that sort of great stabilizing mm. middle is missing, then it has that same knock-on effect in politics. It polarizes mm. politics. I think we certainly saw that in the 2016 election here in this country. Well, absolutely. And I think previous ones, too, it's sort of been building up. Yeah. And, so, and so I sort of want to follow up on that. So Trump, I think, identified the grievance, the, the sense of dislocation and lost opportunity that some Americans feel. Uh, and so he, he has used that. Uh, but I have not seen sort of a, a, a legislative agenda, a, a policy agenda, to try to address any of those grievances. I've seen a political strategy to exploit them. Is that is that? Am I being overly critical? No, I, th I think you're. Um, I think you're being entirely fair. Um, maybe too fair. It, it he's been. Uh, you could argue that the way he campaigned, which was for the forgotten American, mm -hmm. which was for big infrastructure, which was for investment in their um, ability to. Um, cope with the labor market and get meaningful jobs has been a, one of the biggest bait and switches of all time. I mean, that, that tax bill, um, you know, was, a, was the Koch brothers' sort of dream of a tax bill. Uh, and, and so, you know, he's, to put it very mildly, not been addressing the forgotten American um, in, in, in economic terms since coming to, um, since in his inauguration. But of course, he has been trolling the liberals brilliantly. He is the sort of master, sort of gold medal winning Olympic master <laughs> of trolling liberals. Um, and, you know, part of that in this era of what political scientists call <clears throat> negative partisanship, which means that you're not, you don't belong to your party because you love your party. You belong to your party because you really hate the other one. Mm -hmm. He is delivering on that. He is providing outlet for um, the continual trolling of liberals and the mocking of the hypocrisies of the elites and so forth. Do you, do you think this is a, a, a planned, deliberate strategy by the president and, and many of his allies, we should note, or this is serendipitous or a result of personality, or is there a master plan of some sort at work, do you think? 
He, I mean, he is a very interesting character. If you look at his sort of career, his biography, there is a sort of kiss up, kick down quality to how he's navigated New York society and how he's played the New York tabloids. Which is a, a tough place to thrive or succeed at any level, really. Exactly. And so, you know, to get through that, you know, you're going you're gonna to bring a certain political culture with you. And I think, you know, we, we, we need to understand just how much New York tabloid culture mm. is in his sort of political way of operating. So I think, you know, he does, you go and see him at rallies and you see him try out a lot of different lines and some of them just fall flat and then some spark and then he, he lights up and he goes with that one and he digs deeper, which is what happened with the NFL kneeling mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. It was one of 30, 40 lines he was trying out. There's this audience sort of market testing um, skill kind of diabolical skill. Yeah, I mean, that, that requires a talent of, yeah. of, of yes. some sort, no question about it, to be able to do that. It, it is a remarkable talent. I mean, I don't think it's a talent that is serving America, right? but it got him to the White House, and it might get him back to the White House. Let me, uh, I, I want to, we want to talk a little bit about the impact of, of Trump, but I want to, one last thought on, on, on the book. Uh, you wrote, and I'm quoting here, here then is the crux of the West's crisis. Our societies are split between the will of the people and the rule of the experts. The tyranny of the majority versus the club of self-serving insiders. Britain versus Brussels, West Virginia versus Washington. It follows that the election of Trump and Britain's exit from Europe is a reassertion of the popular will. In the words of one Dutch scholar, Western populism is an illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. That's powerful. There's a lot of ideas in that. But unpack for us this notion of illiberal democracies and undemocratic liberals. Uh, so the person who actually coined the term or picked up the, the term illiberal democracy and made it his own was uh, Viktor Orban who's the, um, the leader of the Prime Minister of Hungary and who is an unabashed sort of Christian civilizationist. He doesn't believe there should be immigration of non-Christians into Europe. He wants a sort of, he want, it's the equivalent of America first, it's just Hungary first. And mm -hmm. he wants that for Hungary and he wants that for Europe. Steve Bannon is a great supporter of him. Uh, his great sort of um, bugbear is George Soros. Is that, that's the sort of person we're talking about. Um, and he believes that the popular folk theory of democracy is democracy is just like what most people want, they vote for and they get it. Right. It doesn't sort of direct really, democracy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which goes very much against the more sophisticated and I think historical view of what democracy is, which is having systems of protections for people and rights and rules and processes to protect against what de Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, balance off these competing interests because there is no such thing as one view of the people, you know, that is clear and almost never, except in extreme circumstances. What we're getting today is a growing divorce between those who stress the sort of liberal side, all the institutions, freedom of the press, the rule of law, uh, independence of the courts, um, the separation of powers, um, the, the liberal sort of institutional side versus the majoritarian democracy side. And when Trump talks about a deep state, what he's referring to is liberalism, right. all the liberal institutions. It's the deep state that is stopping me. I am the, trip, I am the will of the people. Uh, and the more he can use that, um, the more he plays to a, you know, a very common popular idea of what our system is. Um, so. In different forms, populists across the West are claiming we are the people against, against the technocratic elites, against the experts. And the perfect slogan in all these elections we're talking about um, in Europe and here that I think I've heard to summarize that is take back control. The British Brexit referendum campaign, take back control. Very clever because first of all, it plays the idea these Brussels technocrats, these foreigners are just uh, micro-regulating us and we want to micro-regulate ourselves, um, or not, as the case may be. But second, it spoke very, very viscerally to what individuals feel about what's happened to their own lives, that they've sort of lost control. Like, like we're doing five part-time jobs, and we're not getting any pension, and there doesn't seem to be any time in the day, and my employer wouldn't dream of training us like my dad or my mum was trained by their employer. and. 
I don't seem to have control over my destiny anymore. So it was a genius slogan because it caught, it caught exactly what people feel inside. And I think Trump, in, in a different way, um, channeled a pretty similar message. And the mistake, if you're running against that, is to call the people who support that view deplorables, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I do believe in separating Trump from his supporters. Yeah. And I think it's just bad, it's malpra political malpractice to call all these people who might vote for you right. deplorable and saying we don't even want your vote. Well, that, that's not a good way that's of, bad of politics. winning an yeah. election. <laughs> but, you know, one of the ironies, of course, is that Donald Trump is one of the elites. He was born to privilege. He has led a very elite life at the top of New York finance and, and journalism and whatever. I mean, how do, how do people who support him and his ideas justify that? It's funny, there was a story that when Trump was showing potential investors around one of his Atlantic City casino sites, they asked him, so what is, they, they, these were Asian investors, what is white trash? And he goes, they're just like me, except they don't have any money. <laughs> um, and I think Trump, because mm. of this um, funny resentment against the sort of more white shoe sort of elites in New York, who never really welcomed him, who looked down mm -hmm. on him, is able to channel um, a lot of people's feelings who aren't, who weren't like him, born into great wealth and um, of storied sort of um, um, value nowadays. Uh, he, he's able somehow to channel that that sent sentiment. The, the currency that he deals in is resentment. What he's able to turn that that into gold, electoral gold. He finds resentment. He can smell it. And then he can turn it into, to coin it. Into and, and resentment, of course, is a very powerful human emotion. Deeply. You know, whether in politics or relationships or wherever. Deeply. It, 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 it's won an election. I mean, that's brilliant, actually, in, in its way. Yes. So, so in your book, you wrote, Trump has made it clear that the post-war U.S.-led global order is history. In one of your recent columns, you said that uh, Mr. Trump knows exactly what he's doing. The fact that he poses a threat to the global order is a feature not a bug of his actions. What are you talking about? So the America first idea um, is one where America is not in multilateral clubs. It's not in part all these sort of big amorphous G, something called G, G7, G20, all these sort of big groups which produce meaningless communiques because America gets ripped off. Um, we're just outsmarted, um, you know, by the clever Chinese, the clever Japanese, the clever Germans. Um, what America needs to do is get into a bilateral world where each trade negotiation, America's going to be by far the bigger partner and therefore it's going to be able to wring far bigger concessions from its trading partner or whatever else is being negotiated. Um, and it's kind of the law of the jungle. We're bigger and therefore we'll get more. Um, it does sort of go against all the theories of, you know, what, what produces wealth and how global supply, supply chains work and, you know, how efficiencies are... Um, uh, how the great efficiencies of the American order, Pax Americana order since the Second World War, has lifted boats across the world, including America's boat. Um, but it's, a not, it's not an incoherent vision. It's, it's what we used to call mercantilist vision. Mm -hmm. It's that trade's a zero-sum game. Economics is a zero-sum game. If you get richer, I get poorer. It's not actually how economics works, I don't think, but it's how he thinks of economics. But mercantilism led to a whole lot of wars, big wars, between big powers over the course of the 18th, 19th centuries. Yeah, so when, um, when Trump announced these steel, and um, I've been trained to say aluminum, but I know <laughs> aluminum tariffs on uh, the Japanese and the Europeans and the Canadians. Yeah. You know, the same week, by the way, that he basically withdraws the one weapon he's got over China, ZTE. Yeah. Um, he 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 uh, escalates the trade fight with Canada, mm -hmm. an ally. Um, that this this um, notion um, that and and this was done, sorry, uh, under national security on national security grounds, um, the two three two section mm -hmm. of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, only been used twice before. He's now saying. We can basically restrict economic uh, change, unilaterally change any trade deal on national security grounds, even if it's some steel or some softwood lumber from our closest ally with whom we've never had a disagreement, a serious disagreement. So 
Uh, who you know, share command of NORAD. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And they're really nice people. Yeah. And they're very nice, they're very polite. And uh, my, my favorite headline ever um, is a New York Times headline. It's considered to be the most boring headline in history. <laughs> Worthwhile Canadian Trade Initiative. Um, was the headline. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to read that one. Oh, those copy editors have their little tongue in cheek sometimes. Huh? I, nowadays, I'd actually read it. I'd be, oh, that could be quite interesting. <laughs> We've got about 30 seconds left. So, in, in that time, how does this end? Um, it continues to get worse before it gets better. The positive sort of thing is that the world is getting less poor very rapidly. Um, you know, 200,000 people a day get electricity and clean running, wa clean drinking water who never had it before in human history. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary lifting of people out of poverty because of the global order that we created, that America created. Um, and no one else can fill America's shoes. So it's going to get worse before it gets better. Trump might be re-elected. We could be taking eight years holiday from American leadership here. But ultimately, there is no other choice. Ed, we've got to leave it there. It's a, the book is tremendous. He's Edward Luce. The book is The Retreat of Western Liberalism. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Storing the Public Square.